In an earlier video, I described a phenomenon that every senior FA is going to face. It starts almost right away and just continues to build. And that's the difference between how much you actually know about the business and the types of accounts you're opening and when. That concept of getting behind the power curve, it's just permanent. That's the bad news. The good news is there's things you can actually do to fix it. Now, ignoring it, thinking everything's okay, you may well end up like our friend here who figured it'd be a good idea to practice his ice shot or whatever you want to call it. I never get tired of watching that video. But realistically, what we have to think about is what happens if we ignore it? Well, if we ignore it, we end up like this guy. Now, if you're not old enough to know who this is, this video probably doesn't apply to you. But I kind of grew up with this guy, Alfred E. Newman, Mad Magazine. I don't know if I subscribed to it or I bought it at the store where I, I got it. All I know is every time I looked at it, I laughed. Not that it necessarily informed how I was going to live my life, but in thinking about the problem I described in the prior video and the one I'm about to show you, this is how most senior FAs who are incredibly successful, by the way, end up thinking about their book prior to going into transition. If they go through transition without paying any attention to it, some really bad things can happen, a la our guy on the ice. Let's take a look at a client of mine that I started working with, I guess about, no, I guess a little bit over a year ago. We're going to call him Joe the F.A., actually started at the beginning of 2022. So we were together about 18 months. In a later video, I'm going to describe to you what actually happened after we got there. So let's just check out what's going on with Joe. Joe is 30 years plus, works at a major BD. He's got $444 million in assets. Not too bad. 207 households. Okay. Got some control over the book. 2.7 in T12. Average AUM 2.1. Also good. Average production per household. 13,350. Now, what I do in all these analyses, I take kind of three tiers. So I take this number times 1.33. I take this number times 0.67 to get the bottom, and everything else just kind of sits in the middle. That gives me a really nice kind of quantitative view of what's going on with Joe's accounts. Now, as part of me figuring out what the next move is for our friend Joe, I ask about book demographics. The average age of his book is 66 years old, it's kind of okay because Joe's pretty close to that age. Net new assets, T12 at the time, 8.5 million. Yeah, that's so good. Why? Because Joe's running a reactive practice, as you'll see. Where do they come from? Unsolicited referrals. Good news is fee based revenue, 56%. Let's see how Joe's book correlates with what we showed in the prior video. Here we go. Tier one, 39 households. $2,228,000 in T12. 18% of the households, almost 19%, almost 81% of productivity. First question is this, do you think Joe devotes 81% of his time to these 39 people? Uh, it's either yes or no. If you guessed yes, eh, you're wrong. It's no. Do you think these clients would be happy to know that they're not getting 81% of Joe's time, time they're actually paying for? That answer also would be no. Average production per household, 57,000 bucks. I think we'd all say those are pretty good or ideal households. ROA or spin rate or whatever you want to call it, 0.71%. That's good. Tier two, another 22 households, an additional 44 million. Total production there, 291, another 10.63% overall. So total households here, 38%. Almost 92% of the business. So are these households right here, these 61 households, getting this much time? No, of course not. We're not getting that at all. Pretty good average AUM. ROA is still strong. Average bucks per household is good. Now let's look at what happened down here at Tier 3. 85 million bucks down at Tier 3. 146 households. Trailing production, 242. 70% of the households. Now down here, you have a variety of things. You have households that Joe opened early in his career that are still there. You know, the ones you made all those promises to that you're not following through on. Average AUM per household, 587. Joe also has some big accounts down here. 
unfortunately, these accounts have either rubbed Joe the wrong way, they don't get along great, they're not properly profiled, there may be brokerage accounts that are just kind of hanging around, but they're not all that productive, 0.28%. Do we think these accounts are only taking 8.78% of Joe's overall time? Because that's all they're really paying for. This is an absolute mismatch. This makes no sense whatsoever to me. And if we dig in, it gets even worse. Let's take a look at where they came from. These 146 households down here, they were pretty much acquired during Joe's growth phase. He has not added a lot of these people over the past eight to 10 years. He's recognized them. The people he's added fit up here. Folks at the bottom are not following a real strategy. They're basically either calling up, asking for an opinion on a stock or putting their own orders in or other type of brokerage where Joe is not really exercising dominion over what's happening. As an FA, ask yourself a really important question. When you look at your book and you divide it up into clients that follow your guidance 100% of the time versus clients that follow it some of the time versus clients that basically barely follow it, which group's doing best? If you said group number one, you'd be right. Why? Because you're a professional. You know what you're doing and you're not going to be emotional about it. You get paid as an FA to be unemotional. You want to be emotionally involved in the outcome, but a cold-hearted SOB when it comes to rejecting idiot ideas your clients are going to come up with, which are driven by all the emotional baggage they bring listening to their friends who are actually lying to them or anybody else. Your group that follows your guidance to an outcome you set up front is going to do better than any other group out there. The FA acknowledges that the team spends well over 8.78% of their time reacting to this group. By the way, your top clients would not be happy. FA rarely makes an outbound call to this group, and these households lack a primary financial advisor. Hmm, why would I say that? Well, let's see. How about this? They're still there. They haven't gone anywhere. If someone called them up and posed a very simple question. When you look at these 146 accounts, if somebody calls them and says, when you look at the investments you have at the end of the month, can you correlate them to an outcome that's meaningful to you? These people are going to say, uh, no. And someone like me or someone I trained or someone else who's pretty smart about this is probably going to need to look at the statements and these folks are going to leave. Now, you may say, well, don't you want me to get rid of them? No. Why would you do that? What you need to do is address these tiers needs and do so in a way that sets you up ultimately for your transition by making the last whatever years you're going to work incredibly enjoyable by being completely focused up on these two tiers while at the same time, bringing along your successor and allowing that person to turn these folks into real clients, which we're going to talk about in the next video. If you do not address this, picture the guy falling through the ice because that's what might happen as your book begins to fall apart. The most successful FAs I've helped through transition have a process that absolutely locks down a single business going forward that their successor understands and has complete involvement and uniformity in the types of business that they're doing. Be back to you soon with another video and we can dig into this a little further and I'll show you what I did to get Joe ready to rock and roll and enter his firm's program with his best year of production ever. Thanks for your time.